story is a story of conquest, not of men and nations, but of technology and the awesome instruments of military might that help to keep a people free. It is a story, too, of time and distance and those who gave us the tools to master them, to move at great speeds, shrinking miles to inches and days into seconds, compacting the vast reaches of our home planet into a small community of neighbors. It was the jet engine that gave us the speed in flight refueling that made the long journeys possible. But in the beginning, iron men and wooden ships, a few intrepid aeronauts, and flying machines that challenged the imagination, but little else. The technology that eventually conquered time and distance didn't exist at the turn of the century. Flight itself was the problem, and those who accepted the challenge took halting, uncertain steps, testing untried principles in a new and unfamiliar environment, reaching for an idea whose time had not yet come. It took the Wright brothers to carry us to the new world, their frail, kite-like craft surging forward, lifting into a chill December wind. 1903 it was, a place called Kitty Hawk, the North Carolina Outer Banks, and the clock was running. A place for a decade was a decade of slow progress at home, aviation pundits and visionaries were there all right, but government simply was not interested, at least not in a wood and fabric machine of limited speed, even more limited endurance. But attitudes changed. August of 1914, World War I reworked the map of Europe and the nature of combat. On the ground, trench warfare and static defense lines yielded only stalemate. But in the air, above the lines, history was made. Aircraft assigned to observe and spot for artillery flew unchallenged above the trenches. Military leaders saw the potential there, pressed industry to improve the breed, and soon planes of greater speed, longer range, and sturdier construction were flying. Armed with machine guns and bombs, they assumed new missions, interdiction, bombardment, air superiority. The problems remained, both with planes and tactics, and no one knew better than the men who flew. Men like John Richter, Lieutenant, Army Air Service. Richter complained that his spad could stay in the air only 20 to 40 minutes in combat. I had to fly nine sorties on the day the San Mihal Offensive started, he said, adding almost prophetically, we all wished we could refuel somehow without having to return to our bases just when the action got interesting. But Richter, along with Lieutenant Lowell Smith, decided to do more than complain, and six years later, while stationed at Rockwell Field near San Diego, they set out to prove a hunch that air-to-air -air refueling could work and that in the end, the plane's ability to stay in the air was limited only by the endurance of its crew, the dependability of its engines. The Rockwell Field commander, a major named Half Arnold, agreed with Richter and Smith. He encouraged them and told them to press on. But even at this early date, 1923, they weren't the first to try. Daredevil aviators had already made the first known crew transfer and flight back in 21. But the methods left much to be desired. With a five-gallon can of ab gas strapped to his back, Wesley May climbed from the wing of a Lincoln Standard up to the wing skid of a JN4. He worked his way to the Jenny's engine, unstrapped the can, and poured gas into the tank. And it should come as a surprise to practically no one that this pioneering technique did not attract a very wide following. But Smith and Richter had Mr. Ford's better idea. It took 40 feet of hose and steel cable coiled on the cockpit floor, two DH-4Bs, a lot of special plotting, gauges and guts, and Major Arnold's endorsement to get the job done. Handling all the pipes and tubing, not a chore for John Richter. Before the war, he'd been a locomotive test engineer for the old Santa Fe Railway. Same pressure gauges, different roadbed, and a new challenge. First actual transfer of gas, June 27, 1923. Two hookups, 75 gallons, and six hours, 39 minutes of continuous flight. The first demonstration of a workable air-to-air -air refueling system was in the books. But this was the 20s aviation of Carnival and pilots the actors stunting across the country in old jennies, trying to keep bread on the table. The press labeled the Richter Smith achievement just another in a long series of barnstorming gimmicks. Well, the two airmen set out to prove them wrong, and on October 25th, they did just that. Less than 20 years after the Wright brothers' first flight, the two air service pilots flew their craft nonstop Canadian boarded at Tijuana some 1,200 miles in 12 hours, 13 minutes, and 40 seconds. A month later, two Kelly Field pilots were killed in a refueling attempt. It was the first time a death occurred and put the brakes on further experimentation. It wasn't until five years later, New Year's Day 1929, that we got back into the business, this time with a vengeance. 
The plane, the question mark, the men, Major Carl Spots, Captain Ira Aker, Lieutenants Harry Halverson and Pete Quesada, Staff Sergeant Roy Ho. The mission, not impossible, but awfully close considering the equipment used. The job of the question mark crew, keep the plane in the air as long as possible. Test the practical value of inflate refueling, endurance of both man and machine. But there was another task, and to many in the air service in the 20s and 30s, it was equally as important. That job, according to General Aker, was to keep military aviation in the headlines. Let Congress and the American people know that air power was no longer a dream, but a strong and vital link in our nation's chain of defense, and that the air service was constantly working to make good planes fly even better. It was Pete Casada's idea to try the endurance flight, Ira Aker, who pulled together the people and hardware to make it work, and Tui Spots, who marshaled his forces in Washington, getting the support from Major General James Fichet and the air staff, moving the program forward, guiding it. Airplane chosen for the job? A Fokker C-2, a big three-engine transport monoplane, crews at about 100 miles an hour. And because of its size, offer the crew some small comfort for the long flight. Amenities? Well, two wicker chairs, a radio, and a cook stove. The refueling ship, a modified Douglas C-1 World Cruiser, a single-engine biplane, 95 mile per hour cruise. Its slightly lower speed would lead to the development of descent, or toboggan refueling. Both planes hooked together, descending in a shallow dive, a technique that lets high-performance fighters take on fuel from slower tankers while lessening the danger of a stall. It's on the record books today, a gift from the crew of the question mark. That crew helped write the refueling book, and it had its share of problems. One of them, getting the refueling ship to move on the ground from a standing start when fully loaded. General Casada said later the airplane could fly, it just couldn't taxi. Casada's solution, very simple. Two crew members dropped their feet to the ground through a hole in the fuselage and started pushing. Once inertia was overcome, they hopped back on board the rest of piece of cake. Take off for the historic flight, 727, 47 hours, January 1st, 1929. The place, Metropolitan Airport, Van Nuys, California. The crew spent the next six and a quarter days in the air, shuttling between San Diego and Santa Monica, a distance of about 110 air miles. To keep her in the air, question mark linked to her refueling ship 43 times, a total of five hours, 32 minutes. Nine of those contacts made at night. The two ships cruised at 80 miles an hour, some 15 to 20 feet apart, at altitudes ranging from two to 3,000 feet during the day, five to 7,000 at night. Captain Aker, Lieutenant Casada did most of the flying. Major Spots handled the tricky refueling chores, the transfer of food, messages, and equipment from the mothership. Standing in the 80 mile per hour slipstream in goggles, a rubber face mask, gloves, and raincoat, and looking like some creature from an early science fiction epic, wrestled the blocky hose to the fuel tanks, often getting drenched for his efforts when unstable air currents separated the two planes. That fuel hose, by the way, borrowed from a local fire department, and we still don't know whether it was ever returned. The flight attracted newsmen from all over the country and the curiosity of a couple of young air cadets from San Diego who asked the usually mild-mannered Harry Halverson if they could take a look. Well, Halverson was not in a particularly good mood. He turned on the two youngsters and yelled, you blasted flying cadets, get out of here. Courtesy LeMay and Frank Griswold turned around and did as they were told. The Spots family, too, wanted to see the historic flight. Mrs. Spots brought the girls out from the east to watch. They visited the field on the fourth day, and as the plane flew overhead, everyone shouted, everyone that is but little Becky. Her mother told her, wave to Daddy Becky, he's been up there four days. Don't you think that's wonderful? She said, Becky, I think it's silly. By this time, fatigue beginning to set in, the plane neither airtight or very quiet, and after four or five days, everyone getting a bit groggy. A more immediate concern, a gradual power loss in one of the engines. Now, the crew stayed up as long as it could, but landed while they still had enough power to pick their own spot. That point reached on the seventh day, 150 hours, 40 minutes, 15 seconds into the flight, question mark down near Burbank at what's now the Lockheed Aircraft Plant. Final statistics, impressive, even by today's standards. Transferred from the mothership to the question mark, 5,660 gallons of gasoline, 245 gallons of oil, 17 meals, water, batteries, and other supplies, all told some 40 tons during almost one week of continuous flying. The flight over, but not the story of air-to-air -air refueling.
For the next 18 years, it was the British who did most of the serious development and experimenting. Squadron leader Richard Atcherley, during the 30s, looking for new ways to make refueling safer and easier. A looped hose technique he developed doing that job. Sir Alan Cobham modified the Atcherley system in 1934 when he formed Flight Refueling Limited. His goal, commercially market the idea. And five years later, the first successful trial of commercial transatlantic mail service using flight refueling equipment. 16 crossings from Shannon, Ireland to Botwood, Newfoundland. Passenger runs scheduled for the following year. But the war put an effective damper on further development. Our Army Air Forces entered the picture again in 1942 when flight refueling was asked to install its equipment on a B-24 tanker and a B-17 receiver. Successful tests were actually conducted at Eglin that year. But the project never moved beyond the test phase as our bombers were able to meet their mission range requirements without aerial refueling. It wasn't until the development of the A-bomb, the end of the hot war, and the start of the cold that we moved ahead once again. SAC determined it was absolutely essential that we be able to hit any target, anywhere, from any base at any time. And air-to-air -air refueling, the only answer. And once again, flight refueling called in, this time 1948, to convert 100 B-29s as receivers, another 60 as tankers. At the same time, Wright Field given the go-ahead to develop an improved system. But to prove the capability of in-flight refueling to both friend and foe alike, a B-50 Superfortress sent on a special mission early 1949. The Lucky Lady 2, commanded by Captain Jim Gallagher, left Carswell Air Force Base, Texas, February 26th, returned some 94 hours later after circling the globe without once stopping to refuel. That Superfort was gassed up while airborne four times during its record-shattering trip. By 1950, higher aircraft speeds and the requirement to service single-seat fighters pointed to the need for newer, faster, more efficient systems. Both Boeing and flight refueling given the task. Boeing's answer, developed in just four short months, the flying boom, today's standard of the fleet. It was faster, easier to use, a boomer flying the probe directly to the receiver. No need for more crewmen in the receiver, so even single-place aircraft could be handled without any problems. And most important, large amounts of fuel, up to 900 gallons a minute, could be transferred in a short time. Flight refueling's job developed a special system for fighters and probe and drove the solution. A simple hose with basket or drogue at one end. When a thirsty fighter approached, the hose was reeled out, the fighter flying its probe directly into the basket for a hookup. Now the drogue couldn't offload as quickly as the boom, but probe and drogue would permit simultaneous refuelings three at one time, and greater flexibility and rough air. So Air Force now had the tools and the chance to use them. The Korean War, our base is close to the front, sometimes too close. There was no real need for aerial refueling, but if we lost air superiority and had to fly our missions from Japan, the need would be great, and in-flight refueling the only answer. That system had to be proven, it had to be proven operationally. In September of 1950, Colonel Dave Schilling led a flight of two F-84s across the Atlantic on the first non-stop jet fighter crossing. Now, there were problems, but Schilling proved the technique could work. And later, the 116th Fighter Bomber Wing gave the system a thorough ringing out under semi-combat conditions in Korea. During the 50s and early 60s, both SAC and TAC moved along different, yet converging lines. TAC with B-29s and KB-50s, refueling first and second generation jet fighters. SAC with her KC-97s, later KC-135s, working with an increasingly more jet-age bomber force. In-flight refueling gave SAC its strategic deterrent power, no potential enemy target out of range of any SAC bomber. It gave TAC the CASAF, the Composite Air Strike Force, a mobile tactical strike force tailored to meet specific Air Force needs, able to move quickly, efficiently, wherever the need was greatest. Exercises like Mobile Baker and Mobile Zebra successfully testing that system, moving large numbers of men, planes, and equipment to Europe and the Middle East. It was in Southeast Asia that a new challenge lie waiting, dormant now, but soon to erupt and engulf us in the longest, most difficult and demanding war the American people were ever to fight. Yet it was a high-level decision made in 1960 that helped the Air Force better meet the challenge of that war. Single manager concept, the phrase. All aerial refueling placed under one command, SAC, 
a more economical, efficient, effective way to supply jet tankers for whatever need the Air Force had. Do it by 1963. And they did. Long years of planning, testing, coordinating, developing, and more testing. But when the big air push came in 1965, we were ready. SAC did the job, and then some. Young Tigers, they called them, the tanker crews, unglamorous but not unappreciated. In one month alone, KC-135 crews offloaded more than 100 million pounds of fuel to needy F-4 drivers, 105s and 52s, more than 9 billion pounds by the time the war started winding down. Vietnam was their ultimate test, and how they responded already on the record books, measured not by the blurred images on post-strike photos, but by lives saved and missions completed because a tank was there. Heroism is more than a smoking minigun and the gut-ripping pressure of a 6G turn. It's long hours sitting alert, longer hours in the air, flying the anchor, waiting for the call and being there when it comes. It's, it's getting the adrenaline pumping as you reach out to a fighter pilot who has nowhere else to turn. There is satisfaction in this work. There always will be. As long as roaring jets seek to stretch the limits of time and distance and a pulse-quickened cry for help crackles over the radio. This calling, this special bond that unites those who fly will remain. Even though technology gives us new wings to try, tomorrow's wide-body tankers, the B-1, and an eagle whose talons reach to the edges of space. This bond is sure and true, it's future secure. Those who dared and conquered made it so. Those nameless pilots, navigators, boomers, and flight mechanics, the Richters and Smiths, the Halversons, the Casadas, Acres and Hoes, and a man named Carl Spots. They did it. Theirs is the conquest. Theirs the glory.